So let me introduce um, our speaker for the first of Design Dialogues 2020 this academic year. Um, and I'm going to read <laughs> some of the odd things or some of the odd uh, narrative that's been written about Ben on Wikipedia. And I'm guessing, Ben, you haven't got someone that's constantly updating this for you. Who knows? <laughs> so Ben Kelly is a British interior designer who owns interior design firm Ben Kelly Design, BKD. Um, and then it says, he also won awards for graphic design. Nice and straightforward. Uh, ben grew up in the village of Appletree Wick in North Yorkshire, graduated in interior design from the RCA, Royal College of Art. <coughs> Am I allowed to say the date, Ben? He might as well. 1974. And he's cited by the Visual Dictionary of Interior Architecture and Design as a hugely influential interior designer. Um, we'll let the traffic go by. Um, in the 1970s, Malcolm McLaren asked Ben to refurbish a basement rehearsal room for the Sex Pistols in Denmark Street. Um, it led on to uh, collaborations with McLaren. Um, he's worked and collaborated with Peter Saville. Um, I guess he's probably most known for people my generation as being the designer of the most influential club, um, not just in Manchester, but probably nationally, internationally, um, the Hacienda. Um, ben brings a really great project in to us. He is a UAL chair at Chelsea, um, so we're very pleased to have grabbed him in to get involved in this presentation. Um, I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to hand over to Ben. I'm going to ask the person standing closest to the lights, that's you. Thank you to do the lights. I'm going to hand over to Ben and um, me, a you. round of applause, please, for our speaker. Thank you. How do I make this thing go live? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, really what this is, it's a briefing session for a project that I'm hoping some people here in this room are going to engage with. I think. So it's my mission here to kind of um, get you fired up and enthusiastic to join me on a campaign which relates to a heading that I've given um, popular culture and the interior. That's the kind of title of my mission and my... Um, what I'm aiming to achieve. Um, ben Kelly Design, we're actually known as, the, the name of my company officially is Chocolate Grinder Limited, trading as Ben Kelly Design, um, which all relates back to this man here, um, Marcel Duchamp, with his uh, bicycle wheel and a glass. I think it's, um, it's a martini. Um, this is 19, well, the bicycle wheel piece was 1913, so I'm obsessed to a degree with the work of Mr. Duchamp. Anything can be beautiful. So I've got contextual information or images. I've got a bunch of work that we do in the office to show you what we do. And then I've got stuff about the project. And I've got way too many images. Um, this is a piece by, oh, sorry, the last one, Kirk Schwitter's Merch Bow, that was 1921. These are things that are beautiful. This is St. Jerome in his study by Antonello de Messina, 1475. This is uh, Japanese architect, artist Tadashi Kawamata, 1977, as is this piece at the Serpentine. Some of these images, you know, th the relationship between art and design is something that I have always been interested in. So here's an image of Marcel Duchamp producing one of his most famous pieces, the large glass, known as the bride strip bear by her bachelors, even. Um, and here's a chocolate grinder. Richard Hamilton, in later years, reconstructed this piece. It was broken. Um, Hamilton worked a lot related with stuff related to Duchamp. The one on the, the piece on the right, I met Richard Hamilton and asked him to draw me a sash window, which also appears in Duchamp's work. Uh, here's the chocolate grinder. Here's a tin of orange paint. And here's an orange chocolate grinder, which I've appropriated as part of our logo for Chocolate Grinder Limited, Ben Kelly Design. Right, uh, 
where are we? This is, this is 1971, I arrived in London. I stumbled upon this shop uh, called Let It Rock. It's at number 430 Kings Road. The shop has had about five, six, maybe seven different identities completely. It's lasted for five generations and it has influenced people across the whole social spectrum. The person in the jersey there is Vivian Westwood opening up one morning. Here is Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren in the shop. She looked quite extraordinary then, I think. Uh, here's me in front of another version of it when it's called Sex. And this is Seditionaries, which I designed the shop front of and collaborated on the inside of. And this is the brass plaque that announces its name, which kind of looked more like a solicitor's or a lawyer's office, I felt, rather than somebody calling themselves Seditionaries. And here are the Sex Pistols. If you get involved with the Sex Pistols, strange things happen. Um, on Jubilee Day, uh, where are we, 19, Ju 7th of June 1977, the Pistols got on a river boat, played God Save the Queen, Jubilee Day. A fight broke out. I was on the boat, found myself accidentally knocking a policeman's helmet off, and there I am going to Bow Street and spending a night there. Um, as a student at the Royal College, this is the cover of my thesis. I adopted um, a pseudonym as the photo kid, it's called Metal Line Cubicles, which is something taken from William Burroughs. And this was the cover of my thesis, which a person who I got to know called Peter Savile borrowed one day, and it reappeared looking like that, which um, really is what kind of made factory records and allowed them to build a nightclub called the Hacienda. Uh, people, the singer in the group, I don't know how many people know about Joy Division, who became New Order. The singer hung himself, he committed suicide. When this single came out, um, it made a lot of money and they were allowed to do all sorts of things. This was my first uh, professional job for a proper client on a, a shop on Long Acre in Covent Garden, just after the fruit and veg market had moved out of Covent Garden. It was one of the first of two or three that existed in Covent Garden. It led me on, I hate the word journey, but it did happen that way. Um, the door here, there are perforated panels in the door. I met this guy called Peter Savile, socially, and he told me that um, he was designing a record sleeve for a band called Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, and he wanted to make a record sleeve using the least amount of cardboard possible. This was his idea. But he didn't know how to, what to do with the idea. I told him to go and look at the door panel on the shop, and it should be a perforated sleeve. Um, so you see through it and the inner liner comes out and it becomes kind of transparent. It won a DNA D award. Uh, I was then asked to do this little single sleeve for a band called Section 25. So we, we printed it on tracing paper because uh, architect's drawings were then done on tracing paper, believe it or not. Um, and lo and behold, that won an award. So I did a few more album covers. This was a thing called Pornography for the Cure. And I think one of my favourite titles, Ismism, for two guys called Godley and Cream, who used to be in a band called 10CC. And this happened around the same time that I got the job for the Hacienda. <coughs> Factory Records had a band called A Certain Ratio on the label, and the day that I was given the job to design the Hacienda, I also was asked to do this album cover. And uh, I, when you get to graphic design, this is metal type. I actually bought the whole font and... Um, which was, I saw a book by Roland Penrose, um, who founded the ICA, called The Road is Wider Than Long, and he used all sorts of different mixed up typefaces, and I kind of appropriated that one. So we now go to Andy Warhol. Um, this is Andy in the Silver Factory in Manhattan, and that, that particular environment, I think, has actually, one way or another, been very influential uh, with interior design, certainly has to me. Here's Andy. Uh, I visited the factory and somehow walked away with that sheet of notepaper, which I treasure. Uh, he, he put a book out and came to London to do a book signing. So here's Andy turning up at the book signing, look a bit apprehensive, and somebody following behind him looking like Andy. Um, and then um, he s signed the book and looked at me and said, gee, what's your name? And like an idiot, I didn't say Andy, I said Ben. So he signed the book uh, to Ben. I wish it said to Andy, um, and various other bits and pieces that I could gather for him to sign. But 
to me, Andy Warhol is one of the most important artists that has been, along with Marcel Duchamp. So the Hacienda, um, by this time, Peter Savile and myself had worked together, and this was the membership thing. I think it was five pounds fifty, I think, to become a member. But this did, was a very influential uh, piece of writing. This is the Situationist Manifesto, leaving the 20th century. And the bit in red tells you where the name came from. The Hacienda doesn't exist. Uh, the Hacienda must be built. So there's political overtones or undertones, whichever way you want to look at it. Previously with Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, and then more latterly for me with a person called Tony Wilson, who fronted up Factor Records, and the manager of Joy Division, a guy called Rob Gretton. So uh, this was the only bit of graphic information that you could or signage on the club. It was a little granite plaque about that big set into the brickwork. There's nothing else that told you you'd arrived. Um, and this was done hand letter, letter carving by a stonemason. Uh, all of Factory's projects had a catalogue number. So I thought, well, we'll use the number and had these, the number cut out of the entrance doors with glass set into it. I'm going to rattle through these pictures of the Hacienda, but stripes on columns became a kind of the sort of iconic image which um, Peter Savile used with all the graphic identity stuff. Um, roadside bollards, cat's eyes, all sorts of stuff, which kind of the, the idea of the found object, which is an influence back to Marcel Duchamp. Um, the main bar <coughs> I was advised was going to be called the Kim Philby Bar. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, during the Cold War, um, Kim Philby was one of the spies, and Tony Wilson, my client, had been at Cambridge, the same university. So he said, I want to call it the Kim Philby Bar, and I thought, well, the, we'll make it out of a neon sign. And the neon sign was hung horizontally and not vertically. So you, you have to find things. You have to look to see and find things. And then it became what I call the hallucienda uh, when it reached its peak. <laughs> Um, all sorts of projects happened. This was an art installation by an artist called David Mack who wrapped two of the columns. These are album covers, uh, albums that hadn't sold that by bands from Factory Records. Uh, Madonna made her first live appearance at the Hacienda. Here's Madonna on my column. Here's uh, my client Tony Wilson hiding behind a column. Here's me in front of one of the columns at an exhibition about the Hacienda. They made a Christmas card which was a 3D model of the Hacienda, you cut it out and uh, made a model of it, was, gave it to me as a 40th birthday card. We had beautiful little matchbooks, um, tiny little matchbooks for the Hacienda. The, mat the heads of the matches were in orange. Um, this is my membership card. Well, afterwards, a film was made about the club, well, ab about Factory Records and the club called 24 Hour Party People, um, who I ended up uh, in a legal situation be with because they infringe my copyright. Um, Tony Wilson wrote a book about the making of the film. A CD set was made 15 years afterwards. Uh, somebody independently made this. This is a 3D fly-through. He built this from memory. That, that, that just goes to show the kind of level that people got involved with it. It's mind-blowing. These are two of the guys who came to me and digitally rebuilt the Hacienda, and then we made two very high quality silkscreen prints out of it. 25 years later, I think it was, I was asked to design a pair of Hacienda anniversary trainers, Adidas and Y3. These were drawings of the trainers. Those are the trainers. Um, I worked with Peter Savile on the kind of packaging. The box that they came in is the shape of the dance floor from the Hacienda. Uh, these are floorboards from the original dance floor, a bit of context, um, probably worth quite a lot of money now. When these first came out, they were selling at £350 a pair. Within 10 minutes of the first pair being sold, there was a pair on eBay for um, £3,500. And I got married in a pair, and my then nine-year-old son had a special pair made. Um, there was a big exhibition at a place called Urbis in Manchester about the Hacienda and factory, all things factory. And there's this kind of family tree, if you like, which is a bit of a take from a piece by Jeremy Della. But um, I love the fact that there's a cat in it. The, 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 the Hacienda cat 
had a, a catalogue number. The cat had a catalogue number. Um, Peter Hook was one of the clients, the bass player from New Order, wrote a book saying how not to run a club. It was a fairly shambolic, ar anarchic kind of situation, but it was one of the most influential nightclubs ever. There's a book about factory records. The second project we did for the same clients was a bar in Manchester called Dry. These are beer mats from the bar. Uh, this was the front of it. It's still there today. Uh, this was inside. I'm going to quick rattle through these. It was very robust. We build things to last so they have trouble tearing them out. The shelving units here have a slight influence from a, an artist called Donald Judd, who I hold my hands up to. Um, this was a post that I made. Um, it was a photograph that I took of our client. This is our client arriving at the first site meeting in an elephant mask. That's a man called Tony Wilson. They bought this building. The second they bought it, they turned it into a three-dimensional advertising hoarding. These are posters from a band called the Happy Mondays. Uh, and they kept changing it almost every week or every month for about a year before work happened to this building, which was to be turned into their headquarters building. The council could do nothing about it. And in a sense, that has the spirit of the project that I want to engage with some students here, that we've produced a series of posters that lead up to uh, a project or a symposium that I want, I'm going to hold with a load of speakers at the ICA sometime next year. And I love the idea of a kind of anarchic kind of guerrilla campaign with a load of posters to promote what, what's going to be discussed as part of the symposium. So this is just, in, these are pictures of the interior of the headquarters building. This is the entrance. When it closed, it sat empty for years and years, and then another client took it over. In the meantime, somebody made a stencil and did graffiti images of Tony Wilson, the client, which was sprayed on the wall as you go into the club. It was then turned into a nightclub, which we did a scheme for, and referenced back to the orchestral moves in the dark album cover on the bar front with these perforated panels of the bar. So uh, stuff gets passed backwards and forwards all the time. The language changes. So instead of painted stripes on columns, we had neon stripes on columns um, this time around. And this place is still happening. It's a venue and uh, a nightclub. And here's a bit of rock and roll. Here's Hooky, Peter Hook with his band playing there. Um, this is a project I did with Peter Savile. This, uh, somebody in his office morphed these materials together. This is the material on the right, is a, it, was, it was a product called Made of Waste, which is uh, made up of uh, recycled detergent bottles, I think. Um, Peter moved into an apartment in Mayfair, which became his salon, and these are shots of the interior of that place, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but this is all background stuff to work that I've been involved with. I don't usually get involved with domestic work, but when it comes to Peter Savile, I'm quite happy. Um, this was a big project for Halfords. We worked with a design practice called Lipper Pierce, who b went on to become partners at Pentagram, Harry Pierce and Dominic Licker, Li Lipper. Um, but it has a, obviously a big graphic content. We still can't get away from black and yellow stripes. Uh, we use telegraph poles to create signage. This is a bar in Glasgow called Bar 10, which is still there today. It was about maybe 30 years ago. And then this, this was a really important project to me. Uh, this is at the Science Museum in South Kensington called The Basement, which is meant for visiting parties of school children, of which I think they get about 3,000 a day. And it's an orientation space for them to be told what's happening uh, on their visit to the Science Museum. I think about 20 years ago. Um, when we pitched for the job, the then design director, we pitched against lots of big architectural practices. And um, I came out of a presentation, and the design director whispered in my ear, wouldn't it be great if you got the job you could do, quote unquote, a hacienda for kids? I thought that was genius. So I was absolutely determined to win the job, which we did. And the first thing I wanted to do was paint some stripes on columns as a reference back to the hacienda. Um, this is, uh, we work with a graphic design company called Graphic Thought Facility, GTF. This was a, post <coughs> a poster that they did for this exhibition that we designed. Um, I won't go into the details of that. This is another exhibition we did at the Wellcome Foundation, working with uh, a company called Studio Frith. Frith is an ex-student from, was it Camberwell was? Camberwell. Yeah. They did the graphics for this. <coughs> and then we... Uh, 
got a client who wanted to open uh, a series of gyms. He called them health clubs, but we now call them gyms, called Gym Box. I think there are six or seven of them dotted around London. One just opened <coughs> at the beginning of this week on Old Street. This was the very first one we did in an underground car park in Holborn. So there's this massive wall of boxing gloves. All of the gyms have a boxing ring in them. And you can see the language. In this instance, our client found us because he looked around for an interior design practice to work with, thought he'd found the person, engaged this guy to do the work, and the guy went to him and said, when our client said to him, what are you going to do? What's the design going to be? He said, I have this fantastic idea. We're going to do it like the Hacienda. The client said, hold on a minute. He thought, I'd better find the person who did the Hacienda <laughs> and dump the first guy. So, you know, we find a few more black and yellow chevrons. This was the second project in um, what was an art house cinema on St. Martin's Lane underneath St. Martin's Lane Hotel um, in a massive single volume auditorium space. This is uh, one in the city in what was formerly, I think it was Lloyd's headquarters building in the bank vaults. They have uh, DJs in all of these. There's a DJ booth up there. There's a boxing ring. This is in Westfield, um, Shepherd's Bush. There's always a big, quite strong signage presence um, with these places. This is in the spin rooms, this mad neon sign. We worked with a guy called Anthony Burrell, um, who produced these big graphic walls for us. Colour, uh, simple things like changing rooms and toilets. We found different ways of creating big blocks of colour with coloured glass, tiles. So we, tr we make something from very little. This is just, you know, cheap ceramic tiles. Uh, there's a lot of these. But I wanted to kind of get the spirit of it. This was a project for a company called Ideal Standard who produced sanitary ware. It's a showroom in Clerkenwell where architects and clients can go and see all their products and specify them. So we had this big um, tubing run the idea of water running through it all. And then they wanted a big display of sinks or wash basins, which became known as the Great Wall of China. Uh, this was an exhibition at the V&A, um, British Design, 1948-2012, which is a huge, big show uh, of design over that whole sweep of time. Again, we worked with Graphic Thought Facility on this particular one. So we had a punk wall and um, a small recreation of the Hacienda. They wanted that in the show. That's the last piece. I think that's, um, oh, I forgot, Hussein <coughs> Chilean. Um, I had a little exhibition of my own, so I asked a few graphic designer friends to do little posters for it. The <coughs> show was called Rural Studies. This is um, Studio Frith did this one. Peter Savile did this one, which uh, he'd used previously on a, a New Order album cover. He had this kind of um, alphabet in colour that actually says Rural Studies. <laughs> uh, that's Anthony Burroughs, that's Harry Pierce, and that's Andy from GTF. So here's Marcel Duchamp again, a very famous painting, The New Descending a Staircase. There's Marcel descending, descending a Staircase. Um, I was asked by... Uh, the singer of a band called Madness, Suggs, to do an album. He did a solo album. And I thought that Madness, when they did a thing called The Knotty Dance, it looked not unlike Duchamp descending the staircase, so I had Suggs descending the staircase. Here's Duchamp uh, leaving a salon in Paris. They've rejected his painting. And here's poor old Suggs off with his album cover back to Camden Town. That's the end of uh, that section. Right, popular culture in the interior, which... Um, <laughs> is my campaign. I've got a few examples of artists um, working with interiors. This is um, Richard Hamilton. I'm obsessed by dates when work gets done. If I can find it. This was 1956, called Just What Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing, uh, for a, an exhibition catalogue called This Is Tomorrow. Richard Hamilton taught at Newcastle Art School where a student called Brian Ferry, who became the singer in a band called Roxy Music, went, uh, and Hamilton had a massive influence on them. Uh, some more paintings of pieces by Richard Hamilton of interiors. Uh, this is the Roy Lichtenstein interior. 
Yes, it is. And, um, oh, God, help me. Patrick Caulfield, sorry, thanks. So, Jamie Reed, uh, graphic artist, did all this work for Malcolm McLaren and the Sex Pistols on a kind of campaign when the Sex Pistols came out. And this seems, feels to me, it has the spirit of my project at one end of the spectrum. Uh, there are really no holes barred here whatsoever, but you are talking about selling product. I'm sure you've seen all these before. I think Lawrence has got one of these. And they're, you know, they're flyers, they're cheap, they're, but they've become valuable collector's items over the years. You know, massive things on the side of buildings. At the other end of the spectrum is Peter Savile's kind of very considered precise, concise work, very beautiful. So I see Jamie Reed at one end and, if you like, <coughs> Peter at the other end of the spectrum. And stuff that went on in Mad Manchester, Manchester. Then I like the idea of letterpress. Um, so I, this is from a book that I found on letterpress posters. And I just thought it was interesting to look at these because I'm keen on the idea of mix merging analog and digital. And I love the idea of letterpress process with digital process. And these were just examples of messages, simple, in your face messages. Um, this is actually from an exhibition that's on at the VA at the moment, which is the most fantastic exhibition. Uh, called Disobedient Objects. I, re I highly recommend it, if it, I think it might still be on. It's absolutely spectacular. Uh, this was from um, the graphics show at Chelsea. I found it a great piece of work. And then this is Anthony Burrell. Just simple words getting over, making you think. I want my campaign to be thought-provoking, questioning in your face. And I thought I'd go back to the 60s and kind of hippie stuff, which I find equally intriguing as the examples I've just shown, especially this one, which, you know, kind of went global. And I'm not sure if it's just because it's Bob Dylan, or I think it's a, it's a mixture of all of the elements that go up to make that image. Um, so, this is, uh, I think it's still there at the Tate, this is Phila de Barlow's incredible installation at Tate Britain, which I recommend to everybody here because I want to build some very big poster hoardings. This is just some ideas about that we put up, uh, hopefully, in the parade ground at Chelsea, one at Central St. Martins and one somewhere here. They're about five metres long, about three and a half metres tall, and we're going to cover them with posters that hopefully people in this room are going to design. And I thought it'd be nice if at the back of them you could create a kind of shelter where people could sit, and I'm thinking about possibly extending this and there might be uh, sound stuff, stuff to listen to inside of it but that's an extension of the project so the message this my whole concern is the status of the subject of interior design I'm quite concerned about where it stands at the moment and I think it's been hijacked by large agencies and the kind of craft of it has, has kind of got lost so this is my you know, I, I like the idea of a wanted poster. It, originally, it, it was going to say wanted, dead or alive, interior design, but I, Peter Salvo said, get rid of the word wanted, so I did. I do what he tells me. Um, so these are just uh, little thoughts about stuff around the subject of it and what you might, should or shouldn't be doing. And that's, I've, how, how did I do that for 20 minutes? didn't do badly at all, you did 25 wow. minutes. Okay, that's, that's me finished with what I've got to present, but um, I just hope that what you've seen uh, <coughs> speaks to the spirit of what I do work-wise and what other people have done, and this idea of this kind of vaguely anarchic campaign that there'll be some sort of intrigue with it, you won't really know what it's about. I like the idea of fly po fly-posting campaign, these things go up and nobody knows who's put them there, why they're there and a story will slowly produce itself. And at the end of the campaign, you'll know exactly what it was all about. I'll shut up. Thank you. Ben, thank you. That was uh, rather fantastic.
Um, right, we use the next part of um, the session to fire some questions at Ben. I didn't pre-warn you. I didn't go into a lot, a lot of detail. This is your moment um, to ask Ben some questions. I'm going to be kind and kick off um, the first question. And then if hands don't go up, I'm just going to point at people. I'll start shouting as well. And Ben will get very upset. Um, so, Ben, it's very clear um, through your presentation, it's very clear through the work that you've done that the relationship between the three-dimensional space and the two-dimensional graphic mm -hmm. design yeah. is something that's shone through. You've worked with some of the very best graphic designers. Mm -hmm. yep. um, can you tell us a bit about how for you that relationship works and, yeah. and why it yeah. started? Yeah. Well, I, I have always had a personal interest in the two-dimensional image, but my work is to do with producing three-dimensional work. But when we um, started getting involved in designing exhibitions in my office, where you need captions, statements, or a, a whole raft of different kind of two-dimensional work, I slowly discovered that there's a real special talent to be able to do two-dimensional work in a three-dimensional environment. Some people we'd worked with, it was just wasn't happening. And so it's a rare thing, I think, to find graphic designers or companies who can produce two-dimensional work that works in a three-dimensional space. And that's why the people that I've shown today seem to be able to do that really, really well. And it's all, there's a lot of it, well, some of it is to do with process, and it's not just flat print. It's what the materials are and whether you can do something interesting using different <coughs> materials in that context. And that they take on the spirit of what the design of the exhibition is about and the subject matter. So that, that I guess that's really to do with exhibition design. And uh, th there's a special talent, I think, that people who can produce graphics for that sort of work and people who just can't. They just, I don't know, I don't know if it's something with how different people's brains work. Um, but I also, I'm interested in process and taking things out of context and messing around with it. And um, so, you know, the language of the design for the Hacienda, um, stripes on columns, well, you know, that, that comes from the, the, the workplace where you've got machinery and, and, and there's, there's potential danger. So there's hazard signs. Hazard warning signs look fantastic. They're really very exciting things. So you're lifting something from one context and putting it in another. It's, it, to me, it's the whole idea of things that don't belong together, that come together. You know, it's almost like one and one make three. Um, and that interests and excites me. And, and quickly, a supplementary question before I ask for others. Um, the work that you did way back and thinking about Kings Road and thinking mm -hmm. about seditionaries, sex and seditionaries, yeah. and the, the, the kind of sense of how those environments created real yeah. antagonism yeah. 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 in yeah. the visitors. Yeah. Well, y y you've hit on what, what I'm trying to make happen here. Um, and I don't know whether people have seen the little thing that went on the UAL, well web UAL website, but I'm just going to read this out, which might answer your question. That I'm interested in the ability of iconic interiors to affect and influence the direction of popular culture in the wider world. And I've used as an example the shop that you just mentioned at 430 Kings Road, which I've said has morphed its way through five decades from punk to couture in the form of Let It Rock to Sex to, and then Seditionaries, and more recently World's End, where if anybody goes to look at that shop at the moment, there's a big clock, it's got 13 hours, and the hands go backwards. You know, that's Vivian Westwood saying, I'm, I'm here to confuse you, I don't know. But it makes you think. And from that one small interior, I've said, via the platform of popular culture, music, fashion, graphics, law, society and its, society and its values have been simultaneously embraced, challenged and confronted. And I'm interested in interiors that are not, not necessarily quite as extreme as that. that. That, to me, is the prime example of spaces that affect you, affect your life. It's not just some bland interior where you go and, you know, buy a T-shirt, but there's something working behind it. And so the kind of, it's all, it's been, to me, sort of 
grabbed by the mass market and um, I'm looking for where individuals can pop up and make make a noise and, and create something new and different. I find it's, it's all very flat at the moment and I'm waiting for the revolution really. Right, over to you. We've got time for a handful of questions. Who's going to be first? Because I'm going to hand you the mic. You're going to speak clearly so it's recorded. And if you don't put your hand up, I will just hand you the mic. I guess what's weird is that a lot of what I've been showing is, is from you know, quite a long time ago. And um, people in the room, I don't know. I don't know what you look at, what you're aware of going back over the years. What, what inspires you, what influences you? There's somebody. Uh, did any particular musicians influence you the most at all over your Ooh, That's time personal. <laughs> God almighty. Well, if I were to tell you that um, I actually saw the Beatles play live, I saw Jimi Hendrix twice, um, so I'm of that vintage, which I feel is quite a privilege. Uh, you, it, well, you know, it, it's, there's a particular piece of music that I've, I'm obsessed with, which is called Rumble by somebody called Link Ray and the Ray Men. And it's a very sonic, electric sound. Maybe sounds are as influential as actual bands or artists. I, you know, I could say all the obvious almost cliché stuff, you know, you can talk about the Velvet Underground, you can talk about Jimi Hendrix. Um, no, I'm not answering that question. I'll think about it. I, 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 like, I like a track called Woolly Bully by Sam the Shaman the Pharaohs. I, was, I liked Captain Beefheart an awful lot because he was out of the same mould as, if you like, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, that suddenly they're coming in from left field and being difficult and obscure, but the, you can find the references, you know, with Captain Beefheart, the references back to early blues material. Um, you know, Malcolm was influenced by political stuff going on, and it's this kind of mashup and reinterpretation of things. And the, I mean, I almost see w in my office, it's, it's a bit like being in a band. It's a bit like being a musician. And sometimes your guitarist buggers off and go somewhere else, you've got to find another one. But it, it, it is... It, it's a group of people working together, and I like to think that we've developed a language or a handwriting in my office, and you would recognise it, and we, it's quite bold, and it's sometimes in your face. Um, and I've been lucky that I've had these a few, few unusual and interesting clients who've allowed me to do the sort of things that I've done. I'm straying from your question, I know that. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll... I'll um, <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, Hi. Just from what you're saying, it seems that you feel that interiors are becoming quite anodyne and there isn't much rebellion happening. But but anodyne for sure. Um, rebellion, I'm not necessarily, you know, <laughs> expecting that to happen. But if I look around and I think, where, where does excellence lie? I struggle. I really, really struggle. But that was my question, is that where does it lie? Is there anything happening in your mind? No. Not at all? No. But that's what, you know, the, the, the thing that I'm working towards, this idea of this symposium, popular culture and the interior, and dead or alive interior design, I'm inviting speakers from a whole raft of um, practices to talk about the subject, and out of which I hope comes thoughts and ideas about it, uh, that it would be provocative and make a bit of a noise that people outside of it would hear and it would trickle out there. Um, you know, it's weird because architecture is the daddy of it all and then interior design becomes a kind of second-rate activity. It's confusing because of makeover shows, magazines, Lawrence Llewellyn, Llewellyn Bowen and whoever else, you know, um, is it decorating, what is it? It's a commercial activity. I fully understand and accept that and that's what we do for our clients. But I'm just worried that it has been hijacked by what I refer to as agencies, big agencies who are, might be a client, they're promoting product perhaps, but then they, they have a whole raft of shops or retail things, and there's a couple of people in the back room who are called interior designers, and they reference a few materials and a whatever, and out it comes, and you know, it's not really helping anybody, I don't think. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the discipline. 
Um, in your opinion, why do you th how come that's happened? Do you think why why is it so why is it no discipline of rebellion any longer, or not rebellion, but just what you think is interesting? Mm. Um, well, you know, the financial crash didn't help. Um, <coughs> The political kind of atmosphere doesn't help. And I think the education system doesn't help, if I can be as bold as to even say that, standing where I'm standing. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm looking around, wanting to pick people out here who, who feel they want to do something in outside. In, for me, when I was a student, the worst thing was that because it's interior design, you can't actually build it. You can't see it until you've got out and you, you've got a job. And when I was at the Royal College, we, we had the opportunity to redesign the bar. To see your work actually realised is just a fantastic thing. So I want work coming out of people from this room to be out there in, in the world. I'm sure that, it, I don't know if that happens now, maybe it does. And I'm not saying I'm doing anything fantastically different, but I want to make a noise. I want... And there's a kind of thread and a narrative that might run through this project that it might have a digital presence as well. So it's messing around with it. That's what I want to do. I want to play around with it. I haven't really answered your question, I know, because I don't know the answer. I don't know why it is like it is. There are some interesting people out there working, sure. doing things, but um, I think it's about clients, actually. It's a problem. It, it's to do with clients, because unless you have the client who gives you the freedom to do the sort of stuff that was able to be done years ago. Um, for example, the, the Ace Hotel in Shoreditch, the, the client behind that who started that whole project several years ago in uh, California, tragically died a year ago or whatever, but his whole attitude about what a hotel might be or could be was really exciting. And taking on old buildings and you know transforming them, I'd say breathing new life into them, which is what I enjoy doing. Um, it, it's rare that you get a client who's brave enough or is, is scared of the kind of financial implications to push it a bit or, you know, that there's an edginess to it. So it's really driven by clients, I think. Okay. There's a question over there, Pete. Yeah, no. Ben, I'm interested in um, that sort of underlying current sort of anarchy, I think, on I'm angry, it, yes. Uh, yeah, and it, and it seems to distill itself from that early 70s generation, of which mm -hmm. I think I remember. We probably arrived in London around the same time. Okay, 1971, so exactly okay. Well. So, but looking at the, the, the ways in which you might target those action points that you were trying to go up, I think that where, where do you think you're coming from in terms of the ability to prototype your creations when you're trying to make things that are three-dimensional, because it's, it's, it's the opportunity that many students, many designers are looking for, because you don't always have the time to develop it in a factory. So where do you think on how, I mean, I see where, uh, elements of that in, in your project proposal as well. Where do you think that students or young designers might be able to pursue the, the ability to prototype their ideas? Well, with graphics, I hope it's through the posters that I'm hoping was going to come out of this project. Um, with interiors, it's really, really difficult. Although, you know, the whole phenomenon of pop-up whatever they are, that seems to be in one way that it can happen and does happen. It has become a bit of a cliche, I feel, and even corporate outfits have leapt on the idea of a pop-up thing, which started, you know, in a modest way with people trying to do something because they had no money, you know, and they could, they could do that. Um, I haven't a clue. I've no idea how you do it. I don't know. I, I don't know how you... Y what you're asking is how, how do people get to test something out by doing it themselves? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it's, 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 got, it's I mean, there are, there are people attempting that where they take over, as I say, property and shops and yeah. take over yeah. and well, space. Yeah, well, it, 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 needs to, it needs to come down, I think, from, from the politicians, you know, whether it's all of the empty shops on every high street in every town and city up and down the country, that maybe they all need to be made available for free to do whatever you want with them. And, you know, 
something has to happen. It really does. Uh, uh, from a ground level upwards, I think. And it, if you bypass the kind of corporate thing, then maybe interesting things could be done. Uh, some things are being done, there's no doubt about that. It's an interesting thing, because that same period that you were talking about, Kelly, you, you and I will be familiar with uh, the, the, the squatting phenomenon. Mm. The areas mm. now that are gentrified and are, and are worth millions of pounds, they're, they're all being squatted. But, and it was artists and students taking those, those parts over, yeah. just as they've taken over parts of schools. So, yeah. so is, yeah. that, is that a way forward where people actually just claim the squatting? Well, it kind, of, that, it kind of does happen, doesn't it, where every run-down area in London has been taken over by artists, and then property developers think, this is the place to be, you know, and off they go. But that's been happening for decades in one way or another. It's a really difficult question. I, I really, other than revolution, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just looking to poke and prod away at it and hopefully make people think about it. So it, it has to become visible and um, create some excitement. And, and make people think, yes, I could do something. The hell with it, you know. Yes. Um, I'm interested. One of the first things you said to us was uh, the quote from Duchamp, anything can be beautiful. Yeah. And I, I wondered how much that comes into this sort of crisis of the industry and that you feel, uh, it, is it that people aren't challenging that enough? They're creating I, I think it is that traditionally they're not beautiful things. Even, you know, Duchamp's notion of the found object and appropriation, th even that has become commodified and appropriated by others, which, and, and, you know, it's found its way into the advertising world and whatever. Um, whether he's enjoying that or hating it or not, I'm really not sure. I w I, you, you, you couldn't tell on that one, I don't think. Um, How about you? Sorry? How about you? Well, whatever he, whatever he thinks, I'll, I'll, I'll think the same. Um, I'll, I'll ask him later. Um, that, the, the Duchamp and Warhol, I did think of doing a project where um, people are asked to question Duchamp or Warhol, because they are, in a sense, opposite ends of the spectrum, whereas Warhol's dealing with mass production and Warhol was and, and Duchamp was interested in maybe one object. Uh, to me, they've had equal resonance throughout everything, how we perceive what we see and what we use in our lives. Um, I don't know where else there is to go, you know, it's like we've seen it all already and nothing shocks us anymore. There's nothing, we can't be shocked by anything, I don't think. But I think we can be taken by ideas and thoughts. So I'll repeat myself and say I'm hoping that's going to come out of this afternoon with kind of visual manifestations of something that are at the same time beautiful but at the same time thought-provoking and questioning, <laughs> just in a two-dimensional way. But thank you for the question. What do you think it was in your skill and your approach? Going to plenty of parties. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you really had an amazing sequence of collaboration. I've been unbelievably lucky I, when I look back on it, yes. Um, which is why, you know, why I, I, I structured this thing like it was. Um, from a perforated panel to a door in a shop front that I designed, it went to an album cover which went, went to meeting somebody who ran a record, an independent record company to designing a bloody great big nightclub, which went on to doing a thing at the Science Museum. And, y you know, this, y you sow little seeds around and, and mix stuff up. And, and then when you talk, you meet that client, I think you ha it's like fishing, you've got to hook them in. You, you know, you need to... Um, convince them that where, where we're going to go together is the right way to go. Um, right now we, d we have a client who um, run a whole um, series of music colleges and so we find ourselves designing environments where students learn about 
popular music and production and all of that stuff. And so it's almost come full circle that from doing places where music is made and created to pl making places where students learn how to do that. So it keeps on going. But what excited me was um, in my earlier years, I was working for kind of wacky, slightly like-minded clients, oddball people of a similar age who were pushing things along. And when um, I was invited to pitch to do that project at the Science Museum, um, the basement, for the first time it was kind of dealing with serious, not corporate, it's not a corporate client, it's a government funded client, and suddenly you're playing with the big boys. But because the design director said something it would be great if you could do a house end for kids, the door opens and the flood, you know, you're, you know where you're going with it. And it's worked incredibly well, that, that environment. I, I meet people who've been taking their children there, and then another generation have been taking their children there, and another one. And it's still there. And um, just last year, we did our second big project at the Science Museum called Media Space, which I think is an, an interesting environment, which I would recommend people go to. There's a big new photography gallery in there, and a, a more exper experimental studio space, and a not bad cafe bar. Um, yeah. Well, there was a bit of skill in what you just told us, though, I think. You know, in how you, as you say, reopen in. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think if you demonstrate to people that, ah, there's another bit of my speech. Peripheral vision. My, what I w most people walk around like this, and I kick the arses of any of, them, any of you people in the room if I thought you were doing that. You have to be aware of what's happening over there and what's happening over there. And if you do that and you become aware of what's going on all around you in all different disciplines and not just to do with design but to do with what's happening and you then bring that back into your vision and somehow distill it down and that becomes what you are and what you do and you're not just walking around like this because that's death to me. That'll be five pounds from each of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to need to finish <laughs> okay. now. Um, there will be about 15, 20 minutes for people to um, have a, a drink and a snack and to network and talk to each other. But also, um, where's Ben? There's Ben. Ben's going to work with me to take the names and I contact details yeah. of those students that are going to be working I on this I project. think what you, know, what you have is the opportunity to do some work here that goes right out into the world. Hopefully, press will be generated from it. You know, th th it's an opportunity to do something very, very exciting. Th and that's really what I'm trying to make happen here. And I think the kind of critical thing that Ben talked about in answer to Deborah's question was about that going to parties, making connections, and grabbing those opportunities. And unless you're hungry, searching for it, and grabbing it if you can, opportunities like this will slip through your fingers. So <laughs> this is not only a fantastic opportunity, um, it's one that's going to be okay. well supported by um, staff within yeah. the school. Finally, finally, the sort of people that I've got at this uh, event that we're, I'm working towards is um, well, Peter Savile is taking part, somebody called Michael Bracewell, who's a fantastic writer. Fred Deakin, who's a chair in digital arts here, is t being involved. Um, David Toop, who's the um, chair of audio, culture and improvisation, is going to talk about the sound of the interior. Uh, Bridget Smith, who's an artist filmmaker, is involved. An artist called Matthew Derbyshire, who's a young guy doing interesting work. A writer called Paul Gorman. So I've got, there's some amazing people who you may not know their names, but they, they have catalogued what's been happening over many decades, and they are still really very relevant people today, I think. And you know, they may well, we may well talk to them through this process. So there are copies of the brief on the table here. I'm just going to use this moment to promote the next Design Dialogues uh, lecture, which Lizzie uh, Spink, our new course leader for our illustration, uh, will be presenting. Thank you, Ben, for a great presentation. Pleasure.